And... All right. So um, we left off on uh, last lesson, last lecture, we talked about child development, okay? Um, specifically looked at cognitive development. Uh, and Jean Piaget was one of the, uh, what we described as the fathers of, of uh, child development, right? Remember? So a couple other theorists, uh, we, we, there were several other theorists, but uh, one of the other most prominent ones was a guy named Lev Vygotsky. And uh, what he proposed is, if you remember um, how we had specific stages with, with, uh, with Piaget, right? And do you remember, so we had four stages, the sensory motor, the pre-operational, concrete operational, formal operational. Well, um, Lev Vygotsky kind of thought about that and looked at, at uh, his model, at uh, Piaget's model and said, you know, that kind of makes sense, but I think there's more to it. I think there's probably more um, uh, learning from adults uh, as, as, a, as a principle. So uh, what he developed is we develop, uh, we, we wind up, we wind up gradually growing in, in our cognition and how we think and how we uh, develop emotions and how we learn to do things, right? And I always like, so he developed the, the idea of scaffolding and zone of proximal development. So zone of proximal development is the idea that we learn, we, we have an innate desire to learn to do something, right? Like for example, when, uh, do you drive? Yeah. Okay, so you, you learn to drive your car, right? Um, do you think you would have, if you just saw a vehicle and you said, hey, I think I want to uh, figure out what this vehicle thing is, and you never saw a car before, and, um, but you had an idea that it probably got you from point A to point B, do you think you would have been able to figure it out on your own? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So probably through a, an intricate system of trial and error, you maybe would have figured it out, but it would have been a lot longer than somebody showing you, right? So that's the idea of zonal uh, uh, proximal development or ZPD. And I'm just going to kind of do a drawing here of, so this is a task, we'll, we'll just call this like a, a task that we want to learn. Okay. Now, let's say that we know how to walk. Uh, we'll use the, the driving as an example. We know how to walk. We know that putting one foot in front of the other gets us to where we're, we're wanting to go, right? But the ideal task is, is we want to learn how to drive, okay? So we can do it in one of two ways. We can do it by uh, trial and error, which could take a lot longer because these two skills really have nothing to do with each other, okay? Except that it gets us from point A to point B. So what we have here is uh, in order to help us meet this bigger goal is we have what's called a tutor, okay? Now this tutor, just like, it, like a tutor in, in high school or in college, uh, what do they do? What's the function of a tutor? Yeah, yeah, they, they take what they know of that subject and they, and, and they help you with what you know of the subject and they help you meet like your goal, right? So this tutor, it could be anybody, it could be a parent, it could be a teacher, it could be a grandparent, it could be a friend, uh, but somebody that has the knowledge to drive or do whatever task uh, goal you're trying to attain is going to reach out and help you with based on what you know and expand your knowledge and get you closer and closer to driving, okay? Um, so that's the principle of zone of proximal um, development is, is having somebody to help you with, um, with, with that task or observing, even observing somebody could be a training, uh, right? You see somebody get in a car, right? Uh, so even you ride into the car, you probably have a good sense that, you know, which pedals do which, right? Because you're, you're just learning um, vicariously through them. Uh, let's see, let me get this erased. Oh, that's just a brick, great. 
All right. So with scaffolding, it's a little bit different. I mean, it, it's the same. It, it's not the same principle, but it's a. Uh, um, what it's doing is kind of building off of what you know by. Uh, so the example they they have here by moving children just beyond their current level of mastery, learning uh, and uh, learning and su success is more attainable. So let's go back to the driving analogy. Okay, you have no idea how a car works. Okay. Um, how about go-karts? Have you ever been in a go-kart before? Okay. So let's say as a kid, you learn how to do a go-kart and then you see a car that, uh, that maybe you want to get in and drive. Do you think you're going to have a little bit more of a knowledge of how steering works, how shifting works and gas pedals? Okay. 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 So you're, you're taking um, what you're doing is you're taking what you know and building on that, okay? Kind of like algebra. Would you be able to do algebra if you didn't know how to do addition and subtraction and multiplication? Probably not, right? So that's the idea behind scaff scaffolding is taking you, taking children or taking people beyond their level of mastery. Kind of like we do in college, right? Everything builds up until you get to uh, college courses and then beyond. Um, but you couldn't take a five-year-old and put them in college and expect them to do well because they have to gain those skills and gain that knowledge. So that's really just briefly what the, uh, the idea is behind um, zone of proximal development and, and scaffolding. Uh, but it's very much rooted in um, uh, social learning. So we learn socially from others as opposed to just you know, surviving on our own, okay? Which is possible, but we're not gonna have a, a well-developed individual that were to happen, okay? So this kind of leads us into social and emotional development. And the area that I'm going to spend a, a good portion of today in is uh, Eric Erickson's uh, psychosocial uh, development. Okay. And according to Erickson, uh, really humans grapple with particular social and emotional conflicts at specific stages of life. Similar to what we saw with Piaget, right? Um, at certain ages, we can expect to see certain things. Well, Erickson proposed that, yeah, maybe during certain stages, we're going to see ages and stages, we're going to see people dealing with uh, different, uh, different conflicts. Um, he really didn't focus a lot on like learning and development, like cognitive development, like, like Piaget did. So he was mostly concerned with like the lifespan of an individual um, from birth until, until, uh, aging, uh, death, uh, the age of death, okay? Um, so he supported, and I got this, this uh, little chart here. Uh, it should be in your book as well. <coughs> um, his eight stages of, of uh, psychosocial development. And they go from infancy, early childhood, uh, play age, school age, adolescence, early adulthood, and uh, adulthood. And, and then late adulthood. I'm gonna move these so we can hide. Sorry, I want you to be able to read these. Okay, all right, so here's the chart. And we're gonna kind of go through these uh, just to give you a sense of what, what they're looking at. So, um, and, and this really aligns with a lot of what we see with other theorists too, like attachment theory. Okay. So we know, have you, do you know anything about attachment, like children attached to their parents? Um, it's not just the parents. It might attach people around Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Uh, or a caregiver. So yeah, you're right. It could be a, a parent, a biological parent usually a biological parent, but sometimes if that parent is not around for whatever reason, it could be uh, any caregiver, it could be grandparents even. But what children learn earlier on, because we're different, we're a lot different than, than animals. Like when, have, do you have any horses or have you ever seen a deer? Okay, um, what happens when, when uh, a deer or a horse is born? Are they self-sustainable? Can they walk on their own and? Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 deer are about the same. Yeah, so uh, most animals can survive on their own once they're born. The only thing that they really have uh, uh, have a threat to is predators, but they can eat, 
they can, uh, you know, they, they, they do, um, uh, they do breast or they do feed off, off of their mother, but for the most part, they can walk and they can, they can, some of them can communicate. We as humans aren't capable of doing that. Okay. When we're born, we're, we're born with really big heads and tiny little bodies. So we haven't really mastered gra uh, gra grasping anything yet. We haven't mastered walking. We haven't mastered communication. It takes a while for us to develop that. It takes years for us to develop that until we might be even close to being independent. Um, and that's kind of what, what he talks about. And when we talk about attachment, that's essentially what we learn earlier on that we need what from mom or caregiver. Right, food, right? Food and nurturing too. Somebody to hold us and make us feel like we're safe and, and warm. We need those. Those are biologically ingrained in us to, to have those things. So um, that's kind of what he talks about. What Eric Erickson talked about in infancy is the trust, basic trust versus mistrust. Is you trust what at that young age? How are you developing trust? Mm -hmm. To do what? Right, to feed you, right? So you learn. Uh, you learn earlier on when you cry, uh, you get what you need. Sometimes we cry when we just want to cry and have somebody around us, right? Um, but right around zero to one years in infancy, we learn basic trust versus mistrust. And, and the, the virtue you'll see over here in this column here, resolution or virtue, this is what's gained out, out of these out of these uh, stages here, okay? Um, and off to the right-hand side is what is possibly, um, what is possibly seen later on in life in older age, okay? So uh, basic trust versus mistrust. If we have a child that is well-nurtured, um, they're gonna have trust. They're gonna have hope that things are gonna be okay for them, okay? They're gonna feel secure in their attachment. They're gonna feel safe in their environment. Uh, and later on in life, we can see that they have an appreciation for interdependence, okay? So they're okay with trusting other people. So if you imagine a person that, uh, that, that as a baby, as an infant didn't have their needs met, or they were always worried about, you know, they were crying for food and they weren't able to get food. What do you think that does later on in life to the person? person. Well, the baby who grows up to be a person. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So not going to feel that safe and security, right? They're not going to feel that secure attachment to people, which could play um, and how they view the world later on. They, they may not trust people to, uh, they, they may be skeptical, skeptical of, of people all the time. Right. So that's uh, really what trust versus mistrust is, is talking about. So later on down the line, we have early, early childhood, which is one to three years. Now this is autonomy versus shame. Um, so are they able to do things on their own? You know, they start to, what do you mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right around two years of age. That's when we see them actually steadily walking, don't we? Yeah. You know? And sometimes what? Talking. Absolutely. So they're starting to interact with their world around it. And we saw that with Piaget, right? With Jean Piaget's uh, um, cognitive development is they start doing things on their own and interacting with the world around them and moving things around to find what they're looking for. Um, so that happens in, in earlier childhood. Um, now, what, what the, the virtue that we should be expecting out of that is will. <clears throat> excuse me that is that they're uh that they're they're uh, they're desiring to get something and they go out and get it okay um the culmination in old age is acceptance of life uh, life cycle uh, so, i'm sorry cycle of life um which i'm not exactly sure what that means i actually don't like this chart i'm, I'm going to replace it for the next class but what what could be some like shame like for example so let's say potty training is, is what we're going for um the mother or father or, or caregiver or whatever um scolds a child for for messing their pants and not making it to the toilet what do you think that what kind of impact do you think that's going to have on that that child they get scolded 
Okay, okay. Because they feel ashamed, right? They're feeling, they're not feeling like they trust anymore. You know, they build up this trust for their caregiver, their mom or their dad or whatever. And, um, and, and, and now they're, they're, they're making fun of them or they're yelling at them and making them feel uncomfortable. So they're really inducing shame. They're not, the, the child is probably not feeling like they can do it on their own because they constantly have somebody bombarding them with, with shame and, and guilt which we'll talk about here the next one. So uh, autonomy is just, they're, they're able to act on their own. Shame is a little bit of hesitation to act on their own because they don't know if they're gonna get scolded. They feel uncomfortable with uh, doing something wrong, okay? There's no real acceptance for them to, to, to fail because if they do, they're gonna get in trouble, punished or yelled at, okay? So that's kind of where shame comes from. A little bit later on, we, we see um, play age. So three to six years old, roughly, you know, again, these aren't, these aren't hard and fast ages here. And during this stage, we'll see initiative versus guilt. Okay. So what, what do I mean by initiative? Uh, what, what does initiative mean to you? Like if somebody takes the initiative to do something. Like, okay. Okay. So somebody like, uh, like if, if I saw a piece of trash outside, I would take the initiative to pick it up. Okay. Um, yeah. That, so initiative is finding a purpose is, is having a purpose. I, the reason I'm doing that is because it looks ugly. I want to take care of where I work. I don't want this place to be a trashy place. So my purpose is to clean that up. And I do that automatically, um, which is a little bit different than autonomy because autonomy is you can do it by yourself. Uh, initiative is you want to do it by yourself. You want to do something. You want to make a difference. And, uh, um, and the virtue that comes out of that is purpose. Um, guilt uh, would be the negative consequence from that. Somebody that, that does not, or that is forced to do something or shamed into do something kind of going along with that shame theme might feel a sense of guilt. Okay. They're, they're constantly feeling like they're under the microscope or being judgmental, uh, judged by somebody. Um, which, which, uh, kind of adds on to that shame in the previous stage. Okay. And culmination in older age would be somebody that, uh, exhibits humor, you know, uh, and empathy and resilience. Moving down, we have, um, school age. So industrial industry versus inferiority. Okay. So again, you can kind of see what the theme is here, right? You see how this is kind of building where we have, you know, we can do it ourselves. We want to do it by ourselves. Um, we're good at what we do, right? So that's what industry is, is we feel good. We, we are, are competent. We're, we're confident in what we can do and we do it well. And if we don't, that's okay. We'll learn how to do it better next time. That's, that's what industri industry is. Inferiority is the opposite end of the spectrum there where they feel uh, not good enough. They, they, you know, again, you kind of see Shame, guilt, inferiority. You know, somebody's better than me. Somebody's going to take my job. Somebody's going to fire me or something. They just have this constant se sense of fear that um, they're not good enough, and which is why the virtue here is competence. Um, the positive out outlook that we would want from this is humility, okay? Acceptance of other people's lives and, make, and being okay with unfulfilled hope. So if we don't achieve a certain goal, that's okay. Um, we'll, we'll do something else or we're just not going to worry about that. Um, a little bit later on, and, and you could probably relate to this. I mean, is this stuff that you kind of see in your own life that you've been through? Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And that goes, that goes from 12 to almost 19 years of age. Uh, identity versus confusion. So um, uh, depending on how these other align, these other sides align up, like if we have somebody that is that it grows up in a trustful household, they're taught autonomy, they're taught it's good to, you know, to have purpose in things, um, be confident in what you're doing. And if you fail, that's okay. And, you know, if everything else aligns, we're going to see things like identity start to take shape. They're going to be confident in their ability to go out and, and form 
relationships, which we'll see here in the next one. They're going to be confident in going out and in dating or asking uh, people on dates. So their identity is secure. They, they trust in themselves. They trust in their parents. They trust that even if they make a mistake, they're still going to recover. So we really see identity uh, form here um, pretty strongly. Or the other end, kind of like what you talked about, might be confusion, right? What am I? What's my purpose? Do I even care about this? Am I good enough? Okay. So all these things start to play into that confusion. Um, <clears throat> and of course, the, the virtue is um, uh, fidelity out of that one. All right. And let's see. So the, the next one we have down here is early adulthood, which is 20 to 25. Intimacy versus isolation. And you see in the theme here, like trust. Can I do this? Am I good enough? You know, all these things start to play into how do I connect to another person? Because we are all embedded with this, with this drive to, to reproduce. Okay. Um, so how do we do that? We have to connect with another person and that's through intimacy. That's through, uh, being vulnerable to another person, uh, and letting them in so that, so that you can form a, a relationship. Um, if somebody is mistrusting or again, they don't feel confident or they are confused about their own identity and who they are, they're going to feel what they're going to feel alone, right? Absolutely. So the virtue that we hope to get out of this is love. The, um, um, and, and we see this old, later in life, they have satisfying relationships with other people. Uh, they may be married for a long time. Uh, they, um, or they may be in a relationship for a long time, whatever that case may be. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have somebody that just feels depressed and alone all the time. Okay. Uh, and then we have adulthood, which is, uh, 26 to about 64 years old, a little different for everybody, which is generativity versus a stagnation. So these are people, uh, people more on the generativity side are willing to give back. They're, they're willing to help other people um, and, and they care. That's what the virtue is here uh, is they care for other people. On the other end of the spectrum, stagnation is gonna be somebody that um, is maybe serving themselves. Maybe they're not going to work because they don't have to, whatever. Um, they're, they're not looking out for other people, they're looking out for themselves. And obviously the virtue is carried for others and volunteering and stuff like that. Then we have old age, which is the eighth uh, and final stage for, for Erickson here, which is integrity versus despair. Okay. Um, integrity is doing what's right when nobody else is looking. That's the definition of it. So um, uh, what they're doing is offering wisdom, uh, creating a legacy, connecting with, with young children or young adults or whatever to help them you know, learn the, the lessons that they learned themselves. So that's really what integrity is versus despair, which is kind of just looking back in your life and regretting not doing enough, okay? Um, or again, kind of seeing that self-absorbed thing. So you're, you're kind of seeing the pattern here where it trickles down from infancy. Um, and the more we stay on this side, the better developed person we're gonna have, where if we start veering off and mistrust, it's gonna start uh, looking pretty bad, right? So let's, let's go through a couple of these and um, see if you can, can pick out what some of, these, some of these are. All right, so Isabella is a very affectionate baby. She uh, has become very well bonded with both of her parents. The secure attachment that she uh, has established with her parents has paved the way for interaction with others. If, if it is as if Isabella never meets a stranger. So what would you say, what stage, you can look on your, you took a picture of the slide, right? Now, what stage would you say you can see Isabella? Uh-huh. Okay, infancy. So, uh, um, trust versus mistrust, right? The, the stage of trust versus mistrust. Um, so, this is really the secure attachment. Okay, and if we have time today, I'll I'll talk about attachment styles. But secure attachment is talking that she trusts people, right? 
Um, and, and of course, if she never meets a stranger, now a child that is not well adapted or is mistrusting, how do you think they're going to behave? No, they're not going to be very, they're, they're not going to, they're, they're going to be very anxious around people, strangers, and maybe even um, if it's a complex relationship with the caregiver, they, they might not be well adapted at all. All right. Alex has begun to test his mom. He wants to dress himself on his own. He often starts, uh, starts off with his comments, let me do it myself, and has begun uh, to be gun to more than appreciate the world or the word no geez can't read today it's as if the word no is his favorite word alex has become so willful that his mother is not sure how she's going to manage him uh -huh. okay okay what what uh, okay so uh, looking at the categories like trust versus mistrust um what, what would you say the, the category falls under Okay. 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 Uh, uh, how about autonomy? Because he, yeah, autonomy is um, wanting to do it by yourself. All right. He may not necessarily have the purpose yet. That would be the next stage. So right now, he's capable of of doing it on him on his his own. What do you think would happen? So there are two scenarios out of here. Let, let's see how we do with this. Uh, how should his mom respond to this? Okay, what do you mean? So give me an example. Let's... Okay. Okay, okay. Um, but if a three-year-old wants to dress himself, what, what should mom do? Okay, okay. So... So allowing it to say that that's great and praise him, right? Praise him, uh, the child for saying, I, I think that's great. You want to dress yourself. Let me help you. Let me show you how to get the clothes. And, and that could be a learning moment. You remember the zone of proximal um, uh, learning, right? Uh, the, the CPD. Um, that's, that would be an example of where she can model good behavior, right? What if she just lets him walk all over and say, no, 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 no. And she doesn't correct him. What do you see happening there? Uh, right, right. Absolutely. He's going to say no. He's going to be defiant a little bit more. And we're going to see uh, a little bit too far to the left where he might feel confident in his abilities, but he's not really good enough because he doesn't have uh, the skills that he needs. Um, all right. So let's try, try uh, another one here. So Java decided to make breakfast in bed for his father. You can see the trail of milk and cereal from the kitchen to his father's bedroom. Java's father does not scold his son at all. Um, th this was one of the first times that his shy son Java has done something on his own. What do you think? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, what what category is that one? Okay. So, uh, autonomy to uh, versus guilt or versus shame, right? Yeah. And and uh, yeah, uh, uh, that's a good possibility for that one. Uh, because yelling at him might shame him into not wanting to do that again, which is not what we want, because he's already shy, right? All right. So uh, being your own person has become more and more important to Tamika. She no longer wants to dress like her friends. She's begun to express herself in a different manner. There are many things that Tamika is questioning. She questions her value system and values that are expressed by her parents. Tamika is beginning to choose different friends because some of her old childhood friends no longer reflect her values. What would you say, what stage is she in there? In the category. Okay, I and mean, what's the, what's the uh, identity issues, confusion, 
identity versus confusion, right? And um, so she's trying to uh, determine what kind of person she is and what her values, because up until this point, she's been living somebody else's values, right? And now that she's branched out and she's expanded and she's able to talk a little bit more and she's more educated, she's adopting her own values and she's questioning, she's pushing back on her parents. As, as a parent, how do you think the parents should deal with that? Give her advice saying is something Okay. 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 So kind of using, again, using that as a teaching moment for her, right? Uh, letting her uh, make some mistakes and just say, we're here to support you with whatever you want. Now, that would be a, uh, a good outcome for that. All right. Let's, uh, let's do one more. Um, Devin is 50 years old. He has always loved his job and the skill set demanded by his profession matches very well with his natural gifts. Uh, the variety in travel offered by his career satisfies the open personality structure that Devin has uh, enjoyed since he has begun in his 30s. Devin has been in his job position for 10 years. He has become a mentor for his colleagues as well as the client base that is served by his colleagues. It seems that making a difference in the community is what fuels Devin's passion for his profession. Which one do you think he is? Adulthood. Uh, what's the category for that one? Um, yeah, generativity. Uh, gener gen gener oh my gosh, generativity. Uh, yeah. Generativity versus stagnation. I lost the word there for a minute. Um, so yeah, so he's wanting to do what? He's wanting to give back to his community. So what would stagnation look like? What would uh, what what kind of position do you think Devin would be in? Well, he worked on his job and he wanted to do his job. Okay. Okay. He'd probably hide behind a desk, not go out and do anything for anybody, right? Um, probably shifting around from job to job, not have job satisfaction, not feel like uh, he's good enough to do his job. All of those things might affect, uh, re reflect negatively if, if he is in more of that stagnation side of things. All right. So you kind of get a feel for this, right? Um, Let's see. Oh, let's do one more. I like this one. So let's talk about Lydia, who is eight years old, and she begin. She is beginning to struggle with math. The math problem is beginning to make her feel stupid. Lydia has tr uh, decided not to even uh, try to do her math anymore. She laughs and talks in in her math class. School age. School age. Okay. What what uh, what do you think she's exhibiting there? Mm -hmm. Okay, so inferiority, right? Absolutely. So she's probably more on the inferior side. Um, what what can what can her teacher or parents do about this? Do you think? Okay, okay. So the teacher should make some time and help her because what's coming out of this what's the bad behaviors that we're going to see out of this uh -huh. okay so moving down the line like years later if this goes on uncorrected what would happen yeah she's going to be joking around in class because right now she found an alternative behavior as to instead of dealing with the frustration and and learning how to do something she's goofing off and using humor um, which could could be uh, an issue down the down the road for her, right? All right, so you get a sense of all this stuff. Does all this yeah. kind of make sense? Okay. Um, and we don't have to. This is really for a bigger class activity. All right. So the last. Uh, let's see. Let's see what we can get out of today. So um, the attachment theory. All right. So infancy and childhood. Um, we were we were able to uh, monitor to, to observe kids and children and come up with four different types of, of attachment styles, okay? Now, if you look in the resources in uh, Brightspace, I have a couple videos in there, like the Harlow mon monkey. Did you, I don't know if you had a chance to look at any of those. Um, but what that shows is that the more secure that we feel, kind of going back to Eric Erickson's trust versus mistrust, 
the more secure we feel, the more likely we're going to go out and explore things. Whereas if we're insecure and we're constantly scared, do you think we're going to go out and try something brand new or try something adventurous? Probably not. So that's kind of what the thought was behind looking at attachment. And the attachment theory states that there are four types of attachments. We got securely attached, we have anxious attached, we have avoidant attached, and we have disorganized attachment. Um, and again, I've got uh, videos on, on uh, in, in the resources that kind of show exactly how these work. Uh, but secure attachment is just like it sounds. So the, the child feels comforted by mom. Um, when, when mom or the caregiver goes away from the child, the child responds well uh, to, she, he or she may cry, um, but there's no real stranger interaction. There's no strange interaction when mom comes back. Okay, there's, uh, there might be a little bit of separation anxiety, but it's quickly extinguished and the child can function when mom leaves, okay? We have the anxious secure style, which again, is exactly like it sounds. So caregiver leaves, what do you think? Uh, what do you think, baby does? Mm -hmm. They're freaking out. They're absolutely freaking out. So they're carrying on. They're yelling. They're screaming. They're crying. Um, and even when mom comes back, sometimes uh, or somebody else tries to nurture the the child or cuddle the child. Uh, the, the child is not having it. They don't want anybody else. They want their, their, uh, their mom back until mom comes back or the caregiver comes back. They're not going to be cooperative in any way. Um, then you have avoidant. Um, this usually we see with uh, negligent parents. Okay. We have a, a, like parents that might be either uh, not necessarily abusive, but negligent, have a negligent parent parenting style um, where that child is not, they don't feel safe with their parent, okay? So they're constantly doing things on their own. They're leaving, um, uh, uh, holding mom might create some kind of anxiety or mom, yeah. Um, and then we have disorganized where the child's disposition, their temper, uh, their um, uh, temper, not temper. Yeah, their, their mood is just gonna be all over the map. Sometimes they're happy when mom's there. Sometimes the child is throwing a fit. So that's really, what disorganized is. And this is important for growing up too. If, if you had somebody, for example, that's secure in their attachment with mom, how do you think they're going to be as an adult? Well, they, they might be there. Okay. Okay. So, so there, there might be a, a little bit too much, like that would be more anxious, right? So if, uh, if uh, the, a child is really attached to mom, they're constantly going to be around mom, right? They're probably going to live with mom or, or caregiver for a very, very long time because being away from them is too painful for them, okay? But securely attached, somebody that is securely attached, they trust that they're going to come back if they need it. So um, somebody we, in adulthood, we might see somebody that's a little bit more adventurous, okay? They're going to go out and try and get a new job because they, they're more confident in themselves. They feel, it's like I described, if they feel nurtured and happy and healthy, they'll go out and they'll venture out and do things. Um, that, that might be a little bit risky or not super risky. Uh, and likewise, somebody that's disorganized, if they're all over the map with their, with their mood, with their um, temper and, and whatever else, how is that gonna look as an adult? No, they're probably not gonna be very successful or if they are, they're gonna be real jerks, right? Um, so that, that's really kind of what we look at with the attachment theory is how do these four things translate into adults? And you can probably see that in, in friends that you have or family or something like that, who was, who was attached in what way. Okay. Um, so we talked about social development. Tell you what, let's, there is, we'll stop here for today. Does this work? And we can pick up on this on, on Monday. Sound good? All right. Do you have any questions for me? All right. I'll try and get some sleep. <laughs> no, okay. All right. Oh, 